Hello everyone, I'm Sudiksha Joshi and I'm inspired to bring to you people who are forging their own way forward in today's times of change and future uncertainty so that you too can think bigger and bolder and start forging your own way forward. Today I'm excited to introduce you to Steve Roller, who launched his first business venture as a sophomore at the University of Wisconsin. He graduated with zero debt, money in the bank, and 17 stamps in his passport. After a successful sales career, he left the corporate world in 2009 to become a copywriter. He's written for some of the top names in the direct response industry and today runs the Copywriter Cafe, an online community with over 6,000 members. He is also the author of the book, The Freelancer Manifesto, 11 Big Ideas to Stand Out and Thrive in the New Economy. When I think of Steve, I always think of him and his family. I don't follow the Facebook posts of any other person who talks about his individual family members as much as Steve does. He talks about both the small steps they're taking and also the big leaps they're making. There is so much wisdom in his post that I continue to take to heart. He talks about his wife, Emida, a mural artist, and his four kids, three of whom are artists and business people in their own right and a daughter who he likes to call his business tycoon. <laughs> he is my mentor. And when I think of a family who is forging their way forward, Steve's family comes to my mind first. I'm so excited that you agreed to do this interview, Steve. Thank you and welcome. Oh, thank you very much, Sudeesh. And I'm so glad to be here and just very excited to talk with you and just share any um, ideas with with your audience and and i'm looking forward to this so thank you thank you for having me the pleasure is all mine first of all i want to talk about your book um the freelancer manifesto 11 big ideas to stand out and thrive in the new economy you've titled it what do you mean when you say the new economy and if there is a new economy um why do the old economy rules no longer work Ah, good questions. Good questions. Yeah. So the new economy, that's it's a kind of a general term. I don't think I coined that phrase. Or anything. And what I mean by that is um, we're in this state where so many people don't have traditional jobs anymore. And I think this is great. There's predictions. There were predictions even going back five and 10 years that by the year 2020, something like 40% of all workers would be in the non-traditional economy, this gig economy or new economy, meaning that they would either be working for themselves in some capacity or a freelancer or in some kind of temporary or remote work. So I think when they, when they have those statistics, I think that encompasses all those things. But to me, the new economy means that we can offer our skills and our services in a different way than we could have ever done 20 or 30 years ago, especially before the internet, but even 20 years ago, um, we're able to offer, kind of package ourselves and sell ourselves to companies and to other businesses and to other people. Um, and that just wasn't possible. So we've kind of morphed into this economy where everybody can kind of do their own thing and we can work remotely. We can work, you know, we're location independent, we're time independent. I like working sometimes at one o'clock and two o'clock in the morning and I can do that. I like being home with my kids during the day sometimes and I can do that. I like working from Ecuador for weeks and months out of the year and I, I can do that. So all of those things kind of uh, make up what I call the new economy. The, the old economy, things were very much controlled by big corporations and the, the people who had the power to advertise and it was very hard to um, just break off on your own, I think. Um, but so now I can build a personal brand, for example, on the internet. And as a one man show, I can big, compete with bigger companies and companies, even big companies might want my services as an individual. Whereas in the past, 
they would have never considered that. They would have never considered outsourcing work or hiring somebody who worked remotely at home from their office or in, in Ecuador or something like that. It would have been, I, th I think the traditional structures and the, the corporate hierarchy and the idea of having to climb the corporate ladder and pay your dues, all those things have kind of gotten swept aside. And now it's really, hey, who, who can get the job done the best in a way that I like at a price that I can afford? I think it's good for everybody because it, we can shop our services to all kinds of people and people buying those services, I think, are getting more for their money than they ever did before. So there's a lot of things in there, but in general, I, I like it. I, I like the fact that these corporate structures have kind of been broken down, the walls have been broken, and it's more of a, it can be a competitive landscape, but um, it's, it creates opportunities. There's opportunity, I guess that's what I like. There's opportunities for people who may not have ever had access to the corporate lifestyle mm. and, to, and to good money. So I, I really like that, that it's created just tons of opportunities everywhere. That is so powerful. And I hear you talk about that a lot. And, and one, of the, one of the first things that I saw in your book, you mentioned that you decided to leave your corporate job in 2009 when the workplace was in the worst recessions. <laughs> what were you thinking? We, we, did you already see that you could take that leap and just be out there? So you were thinking ahead of the curb. What made you decide to take this leap? Well, first of all, I was a little delusional. <laughs> I did not, I did not have a game plan. I seriously, Sudeesh, I thought that, and I was making good money. So I'm not one of these people that was running away from a boss I didn't like, or a job I didn't like, or a career I didn't like. I, I, I've always done pretty well, and I was making good money, and I liked the prestige of having being in the corporate world and and having the money I had and the vacations I went on, things like that. So I wasn't running away from anything, but I really wanted to kind of do my own thing and, and live life on my terms. I was truly, I, I was joking here just now, but I'm in a way I'm serious. I was delusional in that I thought it would be just a seamless transition. I thought, well, you know, you know, I've, I've got skills, I've got talents. How hard can it be to just start a business, you know? And uh, <laughs> it, took me, it took me a while to get back up to the level I was at, but, and, and I really did, um, I did kind of struggle the first year or two um, trying to find clients and really get my bearings and get, um, get a business going. But my reason for doing it, and yes, it was like six months after the 2008 crash, <laughs> real estate crash and stock market crash and things, you know, so... <laughs> That probably wasn't the smartest thing, but I had come to a point. So I did it for a couple of reasons. One, because I was confident in my skills. I thought I have sales skills, I have business skills, I have people skills. I've done these things. I think I can translate those into working for myself. I was also confident in my own ability to work hard. I've always been a hard worker. I've never shied away from work. I wasn't looking for some easy, you know, sit on the beach with my laptop and, you know, make gobs of money. I didn't, I, I was very realistic about the work that it would take. The reason I did it though, is because my kids were, I'm trying to think 2009, they were 12, 10, eight, and six. And up to that point, because of the corporate structure that I was in and the regular job that I had, I had missed a lot of their I had missed a lot of their activities, you know, ball games, rehearsals, plays, concerts. I had missed some of that up to that point. And I thought, you know what, I don't want to do that anymore. And so the money, that wasn't even the most important thing. Working for myself wasn't necessarily, you know, building a business. That wasn't the most important thing. The most important thing to me was that I would have more control now over my time and how I worked and I would be able to kind of live life with my wife and kids a little bit more. So that actually, that was the main thing. The money, 
that actually took a back seat and I actually didn't care if I made a little bit less doing it that way. So that's, that's why I did it. Is there a mindset shift that you need to be able to leave behind that steady paycheck and take that leap that you did? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, we, we, you know, I, I, I was used to just, I was used to money coming in every two weeks. There's something to be said for a paycheck. You know, some people think, oh, you got to work for yourself and it's so much better to be a freelancer and have a small business and work for yourself. I have to say there's something to be said for getting a paycheck every two weeks, having health insurance benefits and vacation time and a 401k and all these kind of things, these perks that come with a real job. So yeah, I mean, when I, when we left, I mean, we, we were really tight for, I mean, things were tight for a couple of years. I mean, we had four small kids. My wife wasn't working full time at that point. Um, yeah, I don't really remember how we did it, but we, I mean, we, we've always done this, but we drove cars that had 150, 200,000 miles on them. We, um, you know, we just kind of changed the way we did things. We didn't go out to eat as much. We didn't, although I didn't have to buy the clothes that I used to buy either. <laughs> so I didn't have to, I did for, for a number of years now, for 10 years, I really haven't had to buy much in the way of like dress clothes and stuff like that. So it shifts, but yeah, um, you have to make some adjustments and you have to get used to the idea that if you don't work hard and you don't get clients and you don't bring business in, um, there's no paycheck. You know, you're not getting a, you're not getting a paycheck every two weeks. So you really have to look at things differently and budget differently. And you, you have to, you realize that this is all dependent on me. If I don't, if I don't get there and out there and hustle, oh, we're not going to have money next month. I'm not going to be able to pay the mortgage. So there's, there's a little bit of pressure, but I kind of like, I'm competitive with myself and I kind of like pressure in, in some ways. And that kind of forced me to just, that, that was the driver for me. It, it motivated me. So there are many things that I take away from what you share in the book and your Facebook posts. The biggest takeaway for me is you do say the new economy is how individuals, especially students of today need to think about their learning. I feel this air of we are in we are in a new economy, but how we are being taught and how we are learning, we're still learning the rules of the old economy. And what you share in the Facebook posts about your children is a direct reflection of that, of how you're raising your kids. Can you share a little more about your family? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking. <laughs> So yeah, so I had so Mina and I have four kids. We have uh, my my oldest son Alex is in his final few months of a four year acting program out in New York City. So he's been in college, and he wants to be a professional actor. He's going to move to LA when he gets done in May, so he's a couple months away from getting into the professional world. My second son Solomon is a junior at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and he's involved in this really unique program called First Wave, which is an it was the first urban hip hop program at a, at a university in the country, which is a really interesting program. So he's studying. So they're getting, you know, traditional education, higher education, four year degrees. They're both going to have a four year degree. But while they're doing that, they're also studying their craft. Alex is going for acting. Solomon, his major is actually creative writing in the School of Letters and Science. So he's getting a traditional liberal arts education but while he's doing that he's also doing his music and dancing and that kind of stuff and I'll come back to that in a second too. Safina my daughter is an artist and she's taking after my wife Amita and she's studying art and she has even as a high school student she has gotten commissions she's had art shows she's been She's had gallery shows already as a high school student and made money. She's technically a professional artist. And she's going to a prestigious art school next year called the Rhode Island School of Design. And then my other daughter, Zaria, is also graduating in 
they're different ages, but they're both graduating this June from high school. And she's going, she's only 15, but she's graduating. And she is going on to school at Williams College out in Williamstown, Massachusetts. So my wife and I are big believers in traditional education. My wife actually comes from a family of very academic family. Her dad was a professor, had the first um, PhD art program in all of West Africa. Um, she's got a lot of PhDs and very and lawyers and people in her family. And my parents went to college, and so we 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 are big believers in traditional education. But in 2019, I think we have to look at things a little differently. And the skills that kids are learning in high school and in college, I don't think are necessarily preparing them for the real world. But I, I want my kids to get that traditional education. And but while they're there, to make the most of it and do their thing while they're in school too and build and actually like create their own little business while they're in school. So for example, Alex is in acting school. Well, during the summer, he's been doing other jobs and he had a, he did a commercial for Subaru last summer and he's had paid acting things. He was on an HBO TV show last summer. Um, they're working and doing their, their stuff and building a business while they're still in school. Solomon, same thing. He went out to LA last summer for six weeks and during the summer that he could have gotten a traditional, he could have lived at home, gotten a job at a restaurant or something, you know, just a regular student summer job, but he wanted to go out to LA and he did. And he made connections with people in the entertainment world. So he's a dancer and a singer and an entertainer. He made connections with people. He connected with people and did a TV commercial. He his uh, short film was um, shown at film festivals all over the country and all over the world. So he's doing things while he's in school. So I guess what I'm saying, Sudich, is I'm teaching my kids to take the best of both worlds. Take the best of what traditional education offers, learn as much as you can, get as much of that out of it as you can, connect with people in the academic world, professors and people who might be able to connect you with other people. But while you're doing that, do what I'm doing, do what my wife is doing and try to build a business and actually maybe make some money too. But that's not even the most important part, but try to figure out how you can package yourself and your skills in this new economy and not worry about getting hired at a traditional interview for a traditional job. So that's kind of how we're approaching things. So, Oh my gosh, I'm trying to um, synthesize it all, all here. They're trying to build their own world while they're studying, while, while other students are just focusing on getting good grades. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good way to put it. Here's the thing, they're getting an education. They're, getting a, they're, they're all getting a, a very good education. They're going to good schools. My, my sons are in, at great colleges. My daughters are going to very good schools. They're going to get the traditional education. I, I'm not... I don't like it when people really dismiss the idea of education, think, well, just you know, learn the skills that are demand, in demand. And, you know, you can learn things on the internet. You don't need school. I, I say, why not do both? I'm not saying dismiss traditional education or forget that. I want, I want my kids to do both. But yeah, my kids are in, and here's the thing too, they're in non-traditional <laughs> endeavors that most parents would be a little leery of accepting and and actually encouraging <laughs> you know when we tell when we tell people that our kids are going into acting and singing and dancing and art their their first thought is well that's crazy how can you make a living at any of those things and why would you encourage that they're not going to make any money they're going to be poor starving artists or poor starving actors or poor starving musicians why would you encourage that and I say, you know what, and this goes back to the new economy. We're in a different world. There are ways to make money at those things. And you can make a living at things that are completely outside of the traditional 
world of the traditional jobs. And you don't have to be a Broadway star. Here's the, that's the thing too. There's a big, there's a lot of in between between being a starving actor and being a Broadway star or a Hollywood star. There's a lot of in between where you can make good money. Same thing with music, same thing with art. You don't have to be the next Picasso. You don't have to be a Jackson Pollock. You don't have to be a famous artist to make money. My daughter actually is making money as an artist, as a high school student. And if she had more time, she'd be making a full-time living at this. So, so yeah, we're, yeah, we're, I don't know. I'm, I'm encouraging it because I just think why not tap into what you're really good at, what you're passionate about, and then find a way to make some money at that. And these days you can, I don't think it would have been as easy 30 years ago. So the focus, usually the focus is on making students go to like join a STEM career, right? right. And right. that's, that's where people think the money is. But when you, they're, all of your kids are doing their own projects, they are bring, they're actually bringing the knowledge from different subject matters mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. actually applying it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, so, yes, so my youngest, Saria, so she's quite smart, not to brag or anything, but she's quite smart. And um, so her teachers and advisors and guidance counselors, when they see someone who's smart, and especially these days a girl, I, and I think females are underrepresented in, in STEM professions, so I think it is good to encourage girls to go into those things, but that's what they really that's what they really focused on. They thought, well, you should be, you should go into the STEM, one of the STEM fields because that's where the money is and you're smart and you could get into these schools and you could learn it and you could make good money. And she, so she, yeah, she went to a coding camp and she take, she's taken, you know, high level math and science classes and, you know, um, computer programming and things like that. But she just, that didn't interest her and she didn't want, so she's learning it and she has these skills, but yeah, but, but I think she, so, and she's taken all kinds of high level classes, but she's taking what she learns from each of those and putting it into, I don't know, and putting it into something that she is focused on. And so I think, yeah, I think, well, one, I guess this is a couple different things here. We're, we're letting the kids kind of choose their own path a little bit um, with some guidance, but I could have easily said too, I could have latched onto that. And I could have been like a lot of parents and a lot of friends of mine who have kids in school who they see their kid has talent for science or something and they immediately think, ooh, hey, the engineering's a hot thing right now or I know you could get a job in electrical engineering and come out making 80,000 a year, blah, blah, blah. Well, we, we, we always, Anita and I always took a step back and thought, well, okay, that's, you know, she could, or we could really steer them into that or push them into that just because that's where the money is and the demand. But let's, let's just see how this plays out and let's see what they're interested in. So I mean, this, this is not necessarily in response to your question, but we, from early on, we didn't steer them towards any particular thing. Because I know parents who steered their kids into, I know somebody who just finished, their kid just finished pharmacy school because the parents wanted him to go to pharmacy school. He didn't, but his parents did. I know parents who have steered their kids into being a CPA or a lawyer, or an engineer or a doctor or whatever. Those are all great things, but why not let the kid figure that out themselves a little bit? And they are learning things, each of them. They're all very smart in different ways, but Alex is an actor, but he knows calculus. He knows science. He took all those classes, you know, and, and I think it, it does make you a more well-rounded person to have all those skills. But the thing is, you know, I think what they've gotten from all that is learning how to, to think and solve problems. And um, I don't know. I know that maybe that doesn't directly answer your question, but it does. Okay, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> I'm, I'm listening and you're asking so many good questions here, Sadiqshin, and um, I'm listening and I'm kind of actually jotting down a few notes to myself. You are doing it in practice, but some of the things you probably 
are doing it and are not even conscious about it. But I think a lot of parents need to kind of hear it and slowly start to put it into practice, the little things. Yeah, I appreciate that. And you're right. Some of this is uncon. I mean, a lot of this, you know, you could ask me going back to when the kids were little or when they were born and stuff. And, you know, did I, did we have a plan or why did you decide this? I, I, ha I have to tell you, a lot of this was just by just gut instinct and what we felt was right and what we thought was the right thing to do. I have never read like ac academic books on, on any of this stuff. I've never read I've never read any books on parenting. I've never, I, you know, I've just, a lot of this was just based on gut instinct, what we saw, what we thought was going to be best for the kids and not worrying about doing things in a very different way than a lot of people do them. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. So since you've mentioned it, <laughs> I'll ask you, <laughs> so going back to when they were little, now they're all in their te teens and above, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what do you think that you, that you, you and Emida did while you were raising your kids that allowed them to um, think about what is it that they want, you know, to start pursuing, asking themselves the question, where do I want to go? What is the kind of environment that you both of you expose them to so that they could ask that question themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, I mean, we, we always expose them to a lot of things. So, I mean, you know, they obviously had school and the, the traditional stuff at school, but even before they went to school, I mean, they saw, my wife is an artist and she works from home and has a studio at home. So she, they saw her doing things. So I think a lot of this comes from her, really. Um, the creative side of things. I'm a writer, but she's, so I'm creative in that way, but she's creative with art and with her hands and making things. So they saw her doing a lot of that kind of stuff. So they were exposed to a few things early on, like early, early, like art, music. We always had it. We have a, uh, an upright grand piano that we have, a hundred year old upright grand piano that all the kids played. Um, so they were exposed to music, art, theater. We got the kids involved in theater like when they were real little. Zari was four years old when she was in her first community theater production. Like this was an adult community theater production that she had to audition for as a child. And we, not, and, and here's the thing, we, so many parents, I think, put their kids into things that they were in because that's what they know. So I, I was very academic. I was in math and science was my thing. Um, art was Anita's thing. And, and, and then I was also in sports, you know, so I loved baseball and football and basketball. And I would have loved to have seen my kids go all out and be like really good athletes and really pursue that stuff. But I could see early on that they didn't really have a big interest in that. Even Solomon, who's a very, very athletic kid. I mean, he could have played a varsity sport for in anything in high school. I mean, he's very good at stuff. But he decided, even he decided not to pursue athletics in high school because he knew that that would take away time from his music and his dancing and his singing. And so... But or I guess early on, we just exposed them to a lot of things. And we, we really did recognize early on the talents that they have. And I think a lot of parents are so caught up with looking for just, are they learning to read? Are they learning their multiplication tables? Those kind of things. But I mean, we could see at age four that Zaria had acting talent. We could see at age two, maybe one, that Solomon had dancing and music talent. Um, we could see at age three or four that Safina had artistic talents. And so we nurtured the talents that we saw and we gave them extra opportunities. And maybe not everybody has this ability, but, you know, so even outside of the art classes at school and outside of the art that Safina was learning from Amita at home, 
you know, we connected her with other artists and we sat her in the studio with other artists to learn from other artists and things like that. So I don't know, just giving kids every opportunity that we could. And, and, and a lot of this, you know, people might think, well, yeah, maybe you could do that because you had money. I'm not talking about things that cost money and private lessons for this or that. I'm talking about making connections with people and oftentimes bartering with them for things. We didn't pay for private lessons for everything. We didn't pay for coaches and, you know, all this stuff for our kids or tutors or anything like that. No, I mean, we just, we just made connections with the right people. I think I hear this again and again, you mentioning the importance of connection. Like connection seems to be that one key unlocking um, their potential also for you to start your business. Uh, what is it with you and connection? <laughs> <laughs> well, one, I mean, I think underneath it all, bottom line, life is about relationships. I mean, really, I mean, I say this sometimes, relationships, what else is there? That's what it's all about. But that's true in business. And so I just, I, I just find it just a more satisfying, more rewarding, more fulfilling way to go through life, developing relationships with people and having connections with people. So not in an not in a business networking way or anything like that, but just really for the sake of getting to know people and connecting with people one-on-one. -on -one. I think we've gotten, um, especially in business, so I'll talk about business here for a second, but in business, so many things have gotten automated and in the world that we're in, writing and marketing and business, you know, so many things have gotten automated and everybody's all about scaling and you know, automating this and automating that, and leveraging this and scaling this and, pro you know, it's like, okay, that's great. That, but I still, I don't know. I still like to do things kind of in an old school, old fashioned way of just connecting with people one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't build a business this way anymore. But one of the ways I've been able to build my cafe writer community, this big Facebook group that I have, it's got over 9,000 people now. I think when I wrote the book, I had 6,000, which is <laughs> where you got that number from. But it's over 9,500 people now. I have a private paid community of a, a few hundred people. Um, but what was I going to say about that? Um, but one of the reasons I was able to build that is I took kind of a long, slow, steady approach to it. I had a long-term objective from the start. I knew I was in this for the long haul. And I thought, yeah, and part of it was out of necessity. I didn't have an advertising budget to spend <laughs> thousands of dollars on Facebook ads or direct mail campaigns or anything, or, you know, but online advertising, I didn't have the money to pour into advertising where I could have maybe scaled it and grown it a lot faster. But I thought, hey, one, one thing that I can do is I can connect with people one-on-one. -on -one. So over when I started this community back in 2012, and even for a year or two before that, I was very connected with a lot of people on Facebook. I estimate that I've probably talked to probably 1,500 people in my group, like talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, like on the phone or on a Zoom call like this. And I, I just, I don't see anybody else, that, and I'm sure there are people that do this, but I don't see too many people doing that. And I, I did it just one, because it was out of necessity, like I said, but also I just enjoy it. I enjoy connecting with people. And I think we're missing that in this day and age. We're missing this one-on-one -on -one communication. And I still like getting together. Like this week, I've got three local appointments with people for business where we're sitting down at my local coffee shop and talking. And I, I like doing that. It doesn't all have to be by email. It doesn't all have to be online. I, I still like getting together with people in person and talking to people. So I guess my reasoning, the reason I'm so big on this whole idea of connections is because one, a lot of people aren't doing it anymore. So it's a way for me to be different and stand out. Two, because I just really enjoy it. And I, I think it's fulfilling and rewarding. But the other reason is that it also helps me to get a, 
a read on, on where things are and where people are in their business. So my business is helping writers build profitable businesses. Well, if I was only, you know, just blasting stuff out at people online and emails and not really talking to people, I wouldn't get as good of a read on what the current landscape is and what the situation is. So I, I'm able to keep my finger on the pulse of what's going on because I talk to people and they tell me things and they tell me what their challenges are and what their struggles are and what's going well and what's not working well. And so it, it, it helps me, you know, really um, keep my ear close to the ground and, and know what's going on. But yeah, I just, I don't know. I'm, I just, more than anything though, it's just personally satisfying to, to make connections with people, not just in a business sense, but just in a personal way. All four of your kids, do you, are they big on making connections too? Yes, I think so. And I think this was, a, this was not something that we, we or I deliberately set out to teach them. I think, they, I think they learned this just from modeling what they saw. So yes, uh, Amita and I are both big on this. And I think our kids have just picked up on that. Um, uh, I'll give you a couple quick examples. So Alex, his first year out in New York City, we drop him off at the school in New York City, the new school for drama. And, um, and within the first couple weeks of school, he had made a point to walk around his dorm and like meet all the people in his dorm and uh, just say hi. And, and like nobody else was doing that. But he's, you know, he did that and he took the time to get to know people and he's taken the time to get to know people in his, um, in his classes and his professors. And through some connections that he made, he was able to sit in a studio with the actor Alec Baldwin a couple of years ago. He's, Alex was sitting in the studio, in a sound studio with Alec Baldwin on an interview, on a radio interview. And Alex got to ask Alec Baldwin some questions and Alec Baldwin gave him some acting advice and some tips. So that was pretty cool. Um, Solomon, same thing. He, he's just got a way of connecting with people at a very mature level. And again, not to brag or anything, but he's, he's, he's just turned 20 years old. He's a junior in college and he's, he's making connections with people so that he can do his music. A year ago in February, and he was down in Atlanta, he got invited to this music concert thing in Atlanta, and he shared the stage with Peebo Bryson and Patti LaBelle. I mean, these are some big name people. Solomon opened the show for these people. And it all came about because of connections that he made and we made. And, um, and we've tried to help you know, encourage that and foster that and anywhere we can, of course, you know, Amita and I are making connections to help them too, you know, <laughs> so I made, you know, I've made some connections that I think have helped them a little bit with school and with their careers and stuff, but, but mostly they've, they've done a lot of it themselves. And so, yeah, they've picked up on that. And yeah, I think they, they, they understand the importance of connections. I can tell for sure that I did not understand the power of connections until I graduated with my PhD. <laughs> and then I, I realized that how, how isolating that feeling is, when, especially when you are trying to do new things and that you don't know how to turn to anybody, don't have anyone to turn to. And so yeah. um, I've really learned a lot from just how you make connections and and um, a lot of other people that I've kind of learned from is there they too are like big on connections but it's kind of this secret sauce that nobody really focuses on yeah and I think that's because there's not really a way to to teach it you know I mean there's not like a I, I mean, I, I've thought about this, but I don't really know how I do it. I mean, I think I'm pretty good at making connections and developing relationships and, and networking and stuff, but I don't know how I would teach it. I do a lot of it by instinct and there's no one set way to do things that I, there's no cookie cutter way to do it that I could teach in a course or a webinar or something like that. I just do it. So here and there, I try to share stories 
and examples and, you know, hopefully, and I, I, I mean, I know I put some of that in my book too, but about how to do that. But yeah, I think it's, I don't know why more people don't do it. I think maybe because it's not a short, you know, it, it's a longer, I take a longer term approach to it. I mean, I'm not making connections and trying to network just so I can get things really quick and shortcut my way to the top. I'm taking a long-term approach. I'm developing relationships now that might pay off. They might pay off right away, but they might not pay off for a year or two or five years or 10 years, you know? Um, so I think it's a longer, you have to be playing the long game for, for it to, to really to work and to pay off. And a lot of people, everybody wants things like right now, right. you know? Yeah. <laughs> And, and you make a good point, such a good point, because before when I thought of connections, they were like very, it had a negative connotation, you mm -hmm. know, you, it, it was making connection to get a job done, sometimes, right. you know, having that cultish feel to it. Yeah. And the way you do it, it's, it's more, it, it sounds so, um, what do I, the word is trying to think um unconditional mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. i mean there has to be a give and take i mean yeah i think sometimes people get the wrong connotation of connecting and in that way too is that well you know you're you're just connecting to, to see what you can get out of the situation and out of the relationship i don't look at it that way i look at it i mean i yeah i try to connect with people who yeah ultimately might be <laughs> helpful to me but i'm well one i, I always want to connect with interesting people who, you know, are hopefully on the same wavelength as far as just their philosophy on life and values and things like that. But, but I want to, but I also want to see, you know, I also expect to give something too. I don't expect to just get something out of the connection, out of the relationship. I'm always trying to figure out well, what, what, what can I help them with too? And that's been, <clears throat> and that's been a use, a good thing too, you know, and, Again, there, you, it might not pay off for years. You might help somebody, and then years later, out of the blue, something comes back to you from that person or a connection, and, and, they, and they pay it back to you somehow. And it's all, so I don't even keep, you know, I certainly don't keep score. It's like, I just, I throw things out there, and I'm, I connect with people. I try to develop relationships with cool, interesting people who are fun and ambitious and smart and just, people who I like and I just throw things out there everywhere. And it's like planting seeds. It's like you're throwing seeds out there all over the place. Maybe you're, you're circling back around, you're fertilizing it, you're watering things, you're fertilizing, you're, you're staying connected with people, you're circling back, you're having conversations. I mean, I, I, I connect with people all the time that sometimes people that I haven't talked to in five or six years, but maybe six years ago, they came to one of my retreats and we haven't talked in six years, but we'll circle back and have a conversation. We'll pick up just like we just left off. And they'll be like, hey, you should meet this person. Or, you know, I, want, I was wondering if I could introduce this person to you because I think you might be able to help them. Would you be open to doing that? And so just, I don't know, it's just, it leads to a very rich life when you have all these connections that you've built up over years and years. And this is something I think younger people don't get. And I think especially younger people who are operating businesses online, they want everything to happen right now. And they see all these automated ways of doing things with funnels and marketing and Facebook ads. And those things are all good. Those are great tools, but you have to couple that with this idea of connecting with people and building relationships. I think you, you it's best to have both, you know, use the tools and things that are out there, but you have to somehow incorporate this idea of connecting with people and developing relationships. You have to, it's just, it's just the only way to go in my book. Yeah. Now in my book too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, this is why, you know, this is why I connected with you originally too, Sadiqsha. I mean, we didn't, we didn't know each other. We met online. We had one phone conversation, I think, and we, it just clicked. I could, and this is something else. I can read people. And after you've talked to, and this is 1,500 people just in my Facebook group, but I mean, over the years having sales conversations and being in, coming from a background in sales, 
I estimate that I've had 25,000 one-on-one conversations with people. You, 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 you develop a little bit of a knack for reading people in, in, with that kind of experience. And I'm just, I'm able to read people and I get a good, I get a good feel for people. And it's just a gut instinct. I'm like, I like this person or, you know, this person's probably not going to be somebody I talk to ever again, <laughs> you know, but you get a feel for people that you like and, and you just get a sense for people pretty quickly. So, um, I don't know. So anyway, so I just wanted to say that about you. I mean, I got a good sense about you the first time we met and hopefully you did about me too, but we clicked, you know, and um, I could see that, you know, I don't know much about her. I don't know exactly what she's doing, but I have a feeling somewhere along the line, we're going to talk again. We're going to connect again and we're going to stay connected. And I don't know, it's been two or three years now and here we are. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I so appreciate that you um, actually jumped on a one hour Zoom call with me with just after a few Facebook comments, it was like surreal. And you're the first business person who has done that. And I was like, because I was able to connect with you, for me, it was like an encouragement that, okay, um, maybe other, there might be other people out there who would be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And, and I do that for other people on my own right now, because I know that this is the right thing to do. Like before you would question yeah. yourself. Yeah. Now yeah. it's kind of a validation. Yeah, that's cool. And I, I just, I hope I, you know, in the world that we're in and with every, again, every, I love all the tools and all the stuff that we have the ability to connect with people online, but I want to take as many things from just surface level Facebook messenger comments or comments in a Facebook group or email exchange. I want to take things to the next deeper level as much as I can. And I think more and more people I think are catching that. And I think a lot of people do anyways, but I, I want to see can things continue to go beyond that and, and, and be like the way they used to be before we had the internet. And I, I think that's happening, but I think there's going to be a divide. And I think people that really get this idea and really know how to connect with people and develop relationships. I think there's going to, those kind of people are going, people like us are going to have an easier time with it in the, in the future. And there's going to be a different style of doing business too, with people that are doing it this way and people that are not doing it that way. Just my, just my prediction. Yeah. Your prediction. So it's back to your kids. <laughs> Um, you are raising very independent kids. This probably means that you run into situations when they make decisions that you have reservations about, or perhaps <laughs> you disagree with. How do you handle such situations? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's been a number of things where they're, they're just like, you know, we're, we're not going to, you know. Yeah, the, so they are definitely independent-minded and... Um, I won't use names to call any of them out individually, but um, yeah, they've each done things that we kind of question, but you know, we've given them space and we've let them do things. And sometimes they've learned by that example and some, t you know, and then moved on. But I think overall, I think it's good to give kids a little bit of a, give them some slack and give them some opportunities to make their own decisions and make some mistakes. You know, I mean, it, it's a hard thing to watch, you know this, but it's a hard thing to watch your kids make mistakes and you want to protect them from all the mistakes that we made and you don't want them to have the same, go down the same paths and have the same pain on things. But, um, you know, whether that's on relationships or academic decisions or business decisions or friends or whatever it might be. Um, but you know, at a certain point, little by little, I mean, it starts a little bit when they're teenagers. And then by the time they are 18, and then they go off to school, you kind of don't have a lot of control anyways, at that point anymore. So you, so I guess giving them a little bit of opportunity to make their own decisions and fail along the way. Have all four of your kids um, read this book? Honestly, I don't think so. No. <laughs> I think my son, uh, I think Solomon has and Alex has. 
Um, and actually, this was something interesting. One of my friends, one of Solomon's friends read it. I was like, oh my gosh, some 19 or 20 year old kid at college is reading my book. And he said he really liked it. I don't think Safina's read it, and I'm not sure if Zaria has either. Um, but my grandma, who's going to be 102 years old next month, she's 101, she read it. And you saw I, I mentioned her in the book too, but um, she read my book and she really liked it. So she understands what I do now, kind of. She knows I'm a writer and I'm a, I'm a real writer now because I actually have a book. But she, she read it and my, one of my aunts who is in her late 70s who doesn't read much at all, she read it. And um, uh, somebody else too. Oh, one of my sister's friends like saw it. My sister has it. So my, my siblings have read it. And so now they have a better understanding of what I do. But one of my sister's friends was at her house and she saw it on the coffee table and she picked it up while they were like, so everyone else is having a conversation. This friend of hers like read half of my book while she was at her house <laughs> and then she bought it and then she joined my Facebook group. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a cool thing to have. I don't know. I just love having a physical book out there that it, people are reading and there's a lot of good reviews and people all over the world are reading it. And I don't know. It's kind of cool. It, it's the first of what I hope to be many books, by the way. Cool. And, and, and I definitely think that this is, it says the freelancer manifesto. Um, and a lot of people might think, well, I'm not a freelancer. Well, but I think it is a book for every person to start asking themselves some questions that they've probably never asked before, you know, and see things from a new perspective. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think at some point, here's the thing, I think at some point, even if somebody's got a great job, very happy and not planning to go anywhere, I think at some point down the road, most people in life are going to have some kind of, even if it's not their full-time endeavor, they might have a as people call it nowadays, a side hustle. They might have something on the side. And almost, I tell you what, almost everybody I know, really these days, almost everybody I know has something that they want to develop on the side. A friend of mine just left a great job that he had for 13 years, and he's a full-time, um, he's going full-time freelance photography now. And he's read my book. Um, a voiceover artist read my book. I, actors have read my book. Musicians have read my book. All kinds of people I think it would help. Um, so anyways, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not just for people who are freelancers, definitely not just for freelance writers, but anybody who wants to consider this idea of it being in the, the new economy. That's perfect. Okay. So the last question for you, um, for the day, how can people connect with you and do you have any parting words for the audience? Yeah, so thank you for asking. Um, so people can connect with me. Uh, Cafe Writer is my website, Cafe Writer. And if you go to the bottom, I send out emails twice a week. Uh, just tips on business and, you know, just business and life. I send out emails on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if you want to hear more about me, get on my email list, um, cafewriter.com. And I have all kinds of blog posts. I have 150 blog posts up there. Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, I have a Cafe Writer Facebook group. That's a free group that gives people ideas and stuff. Um, on Amazon, of course, my book, The Freelancer Manifesto, you can find me there. So those, that's how people can find me. Parting words. I would just say, follow what you, think about what you really want to do. And um, think about living life on your terms. And what does that look like? And if you want to, if you want to just operate in a different way than the traditional job structure. And if you just want to follow a path and figure out how to package yourself and sell your services, um, check out my book. Um, but even aside from that, but just do what, do what's in your heart and do what you really always wanted to do. I mean, life is short. Um, I, I have too many friends that I, I have friends my age that have passed away. And we see this every day. The actor Luke Perry died yesterday. He was 52. He's my age. And, uh, and I'm like, man, life is short. We don't know how many days we have left. So do, do the stuff that you really want to do. And I guess the last thing I would say is do something that's going to outlast you. I'm big on this idea of leaving a legacy. That's the last thing I would say is just do something that's going to live beyond you that's going to leave a legacy. Yeah. 
And I think because you said that, something that was in the book that really um, resonated with me and now it's coming back is like people, because we've been in this traditional system, um, it's, it's difficult to give yourself the permission to even think about doing something different. Yeah. And there's this powerful two words that you use, why not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All you need to yes. do is just ask that question and give yourself permission. That's so powerful. Thank you so much, Steve. Oh, you're welcome. It was great to be here, Sadiksha. Thank you for the interview and thank you for, I'm just so glad we connected a couple of years ago and have stayed connected and I look forward to continuing the conversation. I'm, I'm happy to do something like this anytime.